Welcome to unit eight. So we are almost finished with our course. Unit eight is really the last full unit that we have in the APUSH curriculum. It will take us from the end of World War II, which is the start of the Cold War in 1945, and we go to 1980. And then the last unit that we do, unit nine, is really, I'm just gonna give you the highlights of what you need, and that would be 1980 to the present. So it's more, we're, we're only gonna have like a 25 question test for unit nine. So this is the last full unit of our course, kind of exciting. So I want us to get started with um, chapter 24, which is about the Cold War here in the United States. So let's look at the dates. And with the Cold War, we've got, um, again, 1945 to 1963 not the end of the Cold War by any, any stretch of the imagination. Um, there is one part in chapter 24 that I want you to skip. Um, there, is, at the very end of this, it, it starts to discuss Vietnam. So any discussion of Vietnam, I want you to save because I think it fits better with a later chapter if we do all of Vietnam at one time because it actually spans five different presidents so we're gonna talk about the Cold War, but then just keep in the back of your mind that the Vietnam conflict is also beginning to escalate throughout this time period, but we're not going to discuss Vietnam until we look at Vietnam in its entirety, okay? So just keep that in mind. Any part of, of the uh, Vietnam War, we're gonna save. All right, so um, containment is going to be the new foreign policy that the United States adopts. You'll remember if we look at this long history of US foreign policy, beginning with George Washington, it was all about neutrality and not getting involved in foreign conflicts and foreign affairs. And we only got involved in these wars when we were provoked, okay? Again, going all the way back with the unfair taxes in the revolution, going back to the impressment of sailors in the war of 1812, then we get into the Mexican-American War, and then that controversy about the border with Texas. Then we get into the Spanish-American War with um, the explosion of the battleship Maine and the DeLome letter. Then in World War I, we proclaim neutrality, 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 until we get um, um, hold of the Zimmerman telegram and then the, um, the interference with cargo ships. So that brings us into World War I. Um, again, a lot of folks were telling me, by the way, on the SAQ that we went into World War I because of the sinking of the Lusitania, and that's not accurate. We still remain neutral and we're pledging neutrality even after the sinking of the, of the Lusitania for well over a year. Um, it, was, it was the Zimmerman telegram where there was this assumption that Germany was plotting with Mexico against the United States, and then... Um, the, the problems with the, the interference with cargo ships transporting, transporting goods to the allies. Um, and then in World War II, we know Pearl Harbor is definitely going to be the trigger point there. All right, but look at this change, look at the cartoon. So we've got the new American foreign policy and Uncle Sam there is blindfolded. He's just kind of walking out on this limb, literally, that's brand new and kind of uncharted territory for the United States. So let's take a look at, at why this comes about. It has to do with this new power struggle between the United States and the Soviet Union. During World War II, the United States and the Soviet Union were on the same side, but there was always kind of this underlying skepticism between Roosevelt and Stalin and Truman and Stalin because of communism. The Red Scare was well entrenched after World War I, here we were aligning ourselves with a communist nation. And there was um, not complete trust in what was, what, what was being said um, by Stalin to the United States and vice versa. So this power struggle really becomes intense by 1947. There had been this effort at Yalta and at Potsdam to work together collectively but that unravels very, very quickly as the division of Germany will, um, will proceed and there's going to be conflict. So when we want to define the Cold War, I want you to look at the dates here, 1947 to 1991. 
The collapse of the Cold War in 1991 will have a lot to do with the new leader, Mikhail Gorbachev, who comes into power in the Soviet Union at that time. And then we will also begin to see some of the Soviet satellite states um, rise up in rebellion and, and gain their independence without much resistance. In between, there is a very, very strict difference um, between the United States and the Soviet Union and the rest of the world is going to end up aligning themselves with one power or, or the other. So these are the two superpowers as we call them after World War II and um, totally different in terms of their philosophies, capitalism versus communism, democratic form of government versus a very, very strict authoritarian dictator. So these are the, the parameters around which this Cold War begins. So we have to go back to the Yalta Conference. Um, before Roosevelt dies, he meets, um, I believe it was in February of 1945 with Churchill and Stalin, and they're already starting to plan out the end of the war, even though the surrender by um, Germany doesn't happen until April uh, or actually early May. So at Yalta, they're trying to figure out, all right, what are we gonna do with Poland? But remember, Poland borders the Soviet Union and the Soviet Union believes going all the way back to World War I in the Treaty of Versailles that Poland was actually more part of their land holdings and territories. They wanted it back. So there's a, a lot of back and forth over what to do with Poland. Um, there's a, an issue about these other Eastern European states or, or countries about what's going to happen with them. How is Germany going to be handled to make sure that it doesn't rise up in rebellion like had happened between World War I and World War II? And then they also discuss and make plans for a new international organization. Clearly the League of Nations had issues uh, and was ineffective. So the new organization, the United Nations is going to be designed in a way that will have more power and more ability to actually maintain order in the world. And there's also a change of opinion in the United States and a vast majority of Americans are gonna be on board with taking this new global lead leadership role um, for the United States. And that's gonna mean joining the United Nations as one of the leaders. So as there's all of this back and forth that's going on, Roosevelt ends up having to compromise a little bit on um, the, the liberation of Europe um, and um, issues related to Germany's independence. And he compromises to move forward. Right, because if there's already this collapse between the Soviet Union and the United States, is the, is the world war actually over? So there is an element of compromise that's going on here at Yalta. All right, here was what was decided in terms of the zones of occupation. Um, going back to this conflict with the Soviet Union over Poland, look what happens. There's going to be part of Poland that is given back to the Soviet Union part of Poland is going to become an East, uh, an, um, an independent nation, supposedly. And we'll see in a minute that that's not going to be fully fulfilled. So here is Germany, and there are going to be four different areas, geographic areas of Germany that will be monitored and rebuilt by the other allied powers. So the pink area, the United States is responsible for that region. France is responsible for the region, of course, that borders uh, its own country. You can see up here the green is where um, Great Britain is going to be responsible for, and then East Germany is where the Soviet Union is responsible for repairs. The capital city of Germany is Berlin, which happens to be within the Soviet sector of Germany. So they're gonna take the city of Berlin, which is gonna have a more densely populated area, they're gonna divide the city of Berlin as well into zones of occupation. So each, each allied country is responsible for maintaining order there, maintaining supplies uh, and keeping everything running smoothly without any sort of um, backlash or, or rise up in resistance. Here's the problem. The United States is also going to adopt a new program of um, containment and the Marshall Plan as we'll see. And the Soviet Union is reluctant to allow those aid efforts to come into uh, their region. 
All right. Also at Yalta, the United Nations was planned. And we said that this is going to update and make more efficient and more effective the League of Nations and its failures. And, and here's how it's going to be set up. Every country in the world um, will be allowed membership. Recognized countries will be allowed membership in the General Assembly. So it's almost like a, a full legislature with representation from all the countries. But then there's going to be a separate Security Council that the five allied nations, so that would be Great Britain, France, the United States, the Soviet Union, and China. Those were the five allied countries at the end of World War II will be permanent members of this Security Council. And then there's going to be a rotating basis for the additional seven that will make up a total of 12 um, members of the Security Council. And so they're going to really kind of be guiding um, the policy making initiatives with the United Nations leadership. They're deciding what goes to the full assembly for vote. They're kind of deciding the direction that uh, policy will take in the United Nations. But also notice that the five permanent members coming out of World War II have a veto over any decision made by the General Assembly. And this is going to become a sticky situation when you've got the United States and the Soviet Union as members of this permanent part of the Security Council each with a, a veto um, allotted to it, okay? So if there's some policy that's gonna restrict one over the other, which is kind of the division in the world at the time, that's gonna be a sticky situation. The very first meeting happens right on the heels of the end of World War II in Europe or VE Day. And they're going to have more or less an organizational meeting in San Francisco. And they um, get the agreements to these policies, these designs, for the new United Nations and they agree that the permanent home for the United Nations will be in New York City. And so there's going to be an effort to build the United Nations facility coming in um, very shortly in the late 1940s. So if you go to New York City today, it's really a great place to go and visit. I went there with my friends and um, you can actually go and well, first of all, you have to apply ahead of time to go in because security is so, so very tight at the United Nations. Um, but once you get your security clearance and you go in, they have these ambassadors or are basically like student interns from all over the world. And um, one of the criteria is you have to be able to speak, I think two or possibly three languages fluently to work at the United Nations as one of these student interns. And that's because when people come to visit, they're the tour guides. And so you wanna have people who can speak all of these languages. Our tour guide who took us around, um, I wanna say she was from, um, it may have been South Korea where our tour guide was from. And she was tremendous and uh, really took us in and, and showed us the, the facility and talked about the uh, human rights initiatives that were very foundational to the creation of the, the um, United Nations. And then we also got to go and watch a meeting of the um, one of the subcommittees in the United Nations. Now, we weren't allowed to take pictures when the meeting was being conducted, but what you have in these meeting rooms, now this happens to be the Security Council meeting room. They were not in session when we were there, um, but we got to at least go into the, into the room. But the members of the Security Council would be seated around this, this large um, oval desk or round curve shaped desk and you would have the delegation from certain countries then behind them you might have advisors um, there's also interpreters who are there so when someone is saying something it's automatically being interpreted into all of the languages and they're all wearing headsets and then it's being relayed in their own language so they have a real-time conversation with translation going on at the same time so the, um, the room that we went into, it was a hearing and it was about landmines. And it was just fascinating to be able to watch how these translators and the committee members were interacting with one another. And if you ever get the opportunity to go, I, I highly encourage you to do that. So this is in New York City. And again, you would need to make reservations far, far in advance to go and visit the United Nations. Um, they've got different exhibits. That was where I saw the, the stone from the atomic bomb blast in, in Japan that has the shadow and the melted 
um, glass and everything. It's just really, really um, a powerful exhibit. So I encourage you to go there if you can. All right, we know that after Roosevelt dies, Truman comes in and he meets again after the war in Europe is over, but before the war in Japan is over and they meet together the leadership at the Potsdam Conference. This is where they, they finalize all of these plans for, uh, for Germany. They discuss uh, reparations. And again, there is a difference of opinion on how those reparations are going to, to go forward. Stalin wants punishment. Again, remember he faced a lot of heavy fighting for years in the Eastern front of that war. Truman, similar to what uh, Wilson had wanted after World War I, wants to repair and move forward. Um, there was also discussions uh, now that the Holocaust is fully, fully understood that these war crimes would be tried. Uh, these, these leaders who were remaining of the Nazi party would be tried in what becomes known as the Nuremberg trials. All right, so here's what's agreed to. They're gonna move the border of Poland, like we said. They're gonna move it further to the West and the rest of that territory that used to be Poland becomes part of the Soviet Union. And all they can get Stalin to agree to is free elections for Poland as soon as possible, which again is pretty vague. And um, we know now Stalin really didn't have any intention of that happening. And then Japan also, um, the Potsdam Declaration is going to say that they agree, all of these leaders agree that there will not be an end to the war in the Pacific until there is a complete surrender, unconditional surrender by the leadership. And then this is also where Truman issues that ultimatum to the Japanese to surrender now or face prompt and utter destruction, which is the atomic bomb because he has gotten word while he's in Potsdam about the successful test of the atomic bomb. All right, so here's where we are. These, these items have been agreed to, but that's not exactly what the Soviet Union follows along with. So they are going to, the area in, in green over here, the solid green is where the Soviet Union has been given territory back from what it had lost at the end of World War I. The area in the lighter green is where the Soviet Union is going to take control of these countries and really influence policy there. Yes, they're not part of Russia or the Soviet Union, but the Soviet Union begins to control them in what are known as satellite states. The Soviet Union is controlling the government developments there, the organizations of the governments, and they are being monitored very closely and under the control of the Soviet Union. So this term, the Iron Curtain, becomes familiar because Winston Churchill, again, very popular after World War II, he actually comes to the United States and visits Truman in his home state of Missouri. And while he's there, Truman gives a speech and he talks about that an iron curtain has fallen over Europe. And it's basically saying that there is a clear divide between, whoops, between the area that the Soviet Union is controlling and Western Europe that's going to be more free and democratic. So look at the, um, the, the part of this speech. We call this the Iron Curtain speech. And I would know this phrase, but look what he has said. A shadow has fallen. An Iron Curtain has descended across the continent. Behind that line lie all the capitals of the ancient states of Central and Eastern Europe. The populations around them lie in what I must call the Soviet sphere. Remember those spheres of influence from the 1890s, early 1900s? He's saying that this is happening again. And all are subject in one form or another, not only to Soviet influence, but to a very high, and in some cases, increasing, increasing measure of control from Moscow. So that's the first time that this phrase, the Iron Curtain, has been used. But you hear that referenced um, throughout the Cold War, that there is a clear divide um, between Soviet satellite states and, and countries that are under their control and countries that are not. So look at this cartoon. This is from a, a British cartoon in 1946. Very clearly, we've got a, a rapid change. So notice that it says to Russia, we've got this iron curtain. We know that it's iron because of the, the bolts here. There's Winston Churchill peeking underneath. Um, and, and you can see that there is a, a lot of um, 
question about what's going to be actually happening over here on the other side. So that's um, the division of Europe. So Truman takes a new route to policy that's known as containment. Once it's clear that the Soviet Union is not willing to follow along with the agreements that have been established at Potsdam and at Yalta, then the effort now becomes to make sure that the Soviet Union doesn't rise up into the next Germany, right? And that they don't rise up and become the next country that's gonna take one country after the other because appeasement didn't work last time. So there's going to be a much stronger response here um, in, in the United States takes that leadership role in these, these, these um, um, policies that reflect containment. So this is the new foreign policy. And I would definitely emphasize this. This is the turning point. The end of World War II launches a new era of US foreign policy. One that is taking a global leadership role in containing the spread of communism. So here is why Truman takes this action. One is that you've got the Soviet Union expanding their, their influence and there is fear that the Soviets are about to add Iran and Turkey into their satellite states. There's also a civil war going on in Greece and Greece we know is a, a prominent country um, positioned in the Mediterranean Soviet Union would like nothing more than to have control of the Mediterranean. So with Turkey, if they could get access to Turkey, get control of Greece, that would go quite far in their control of the economics of that region as well. So the civil war in Greece is kind of this playing out of the, the communist ideas with the capitalist ideas and who's going to win out in that civil war and which way will the country go, communist or not. Um, and then also there are communist parties beginning to take a little bit of popularity in Italy and in France, because again, people are struggling. They had come out of the Great Depression. They end up in this world war and the two nations were physically devastated. And so communism was providing a potential alternative to their current economic situation. So Truman says, absolutely not. We are going to contain communism and not allow it to spread. Now, is he saying that we're going to go in and eliminate communism in the Soviet Union? No, he's not saying that because if he does, we start another world war, but he's simply saying we're not going to allow it to spread. Doesn't this remind you a lot of what we mentioned before in World War II about uh, Franklin Roosevelt's quarantine speech early on when Hitler was beginning to kind of pick off one one uh, location after the other with the Rhineland and the Saar region and the Sudetenland that uh, Roosevelt believes that he needs to be stopped at that point and quarantined and isolated so that it doesn't spread any further. And that was not what the world was ready for at that time. Here, Truman is saying, we are going to take this stand of, of containment now. So the, the country has transitioned its philosophy. So here are the steps that are going to make that happen. George Keenan is one of the um, advisors. He is an expert in Soviet policy, and he is going to provide a recommendation to Harry Truman about how to handle this. And he does so in what's called the long telegram. Typically a telegram is gonna be kind of, you know, a short message. Um, that usually doesn't even have complete sentences that's going to just transmit communication very quickly. Well, the long telegram is literally very, very long. And here's what it does. It's going to recommend that um, uh, the United States adjust its foreign policy and contain it. Look at this last statement here. Um, they know, George Keenan knows that Joseph Stalin is looking to expand his power. Um, so Keenan is recommending to Truman that Soviet, Soviet pressure has to be contained by adroit and vigilant application of a counterforce at a sense of constantly shifting geographical and political points. So he's saying Stalin is not isolating this only to the Soviet Union, that he's looking to spread his influence across Europe. And the United States must be willing to not go back into its little cocoon here in North America that the United States must be willing and ready to go in and stop the spread of communism where necessary. Um, so 
This is also looking at the Soviet Union not getting involved in, in some more international initiatives. On the heels of the United Nations being created, there was also an effort to try to solidify the global economy to make sure that a global depression doesn't happen again. And that's where we have the International Monetary Fund that is put in place. And this is to help try to, to regulate the value of different currencies and um, you know, how much does a dollar equate to in a, um, a yen or a British pound or something like that. And so that International Monetary Fund is trying to, to keep straight the, the currency exchanges and those currency rates and the World Bank is about making sure that this global financial system is stable. Soviet Union's very reluctant to get involved in that. And that's gonna set off the alarm here that George Keenan is sounding saying, you gotta wake up. You've gotta make sure that you're taking clear and decisive action to prevent Joseph Stalin from interfering in the, the rehabilitation really of the world into this new global order, okay? Keenan also is going to publish a magazine that is similar in its tone. Um, in, you know, so the long telegram is sent to Truman and the other government officials. Keenan also will um, write an article in Foreign Affairs Magazine. Now, the article is not signed by George Keenan, but everybody knows that it was created by him because of the contents of, of the, the, um, the article about containment, about those similar policies that he's laid out in um, the long telegram. So this was again in 1947, Foreign Affairs Magazine. Look what he what what it's going to do. This becomes the foundation. He more or less like verbalizes and lays out how this is going to happen. And uh, look at this quote from the uh, the article. We call it the X article um, because again he didn't sign his name. He just signed it as X. Um, the main element of any U.S. policy toward the Soviet Union must be that of a long term, patient but firm and vigilant containment of Russian expansive tendencies. So does this um, refute or support the ideas of appeasement that were used against Hitler? This is the opposite, okay? So this is the opposite action that was taken after World War I when Hitler was becoming more aggressive and more land hungry. This is going to say, nope, we're going to stop it. Um, and the belief here is that over time, if you don't allow the Soviet Union to spread its influence, that it's going to collapse in on itself um, with this idea of, of true communism, all right? The third part of this is that, um, that, that forces the US kind of into this greater leadership role is that Great Britain's power was kind of diminishing. We know that during the age of Queen Victoria that the, the empire, the British empire was tremendous and massive and spanned the globe. Um, that's starting to, to wind down a little bit. We're going to see that countries like India will rise up in rebellion. This is going to be at the time of Gandhi um, demanding independence for India, and they ultimately will achieve that. Um, you're going to see other areas, right? So these are former colonies. All of those in yellow were former British colonies that um, over the course of, of this period of the Cold War, become independent. And then the French colonies would be the ones that are in pink, suddenly becoming independent. And then the uh, former Soviet Union, Soviet states, by the end of the Cold War, these countries that were satellite states would gain independence. So you can definitely see that there is a change, a shift in the world. And um, the US is going to become more of that leader. So it's really the US and the Soviet Union as the two superpowers during the Cold War. And then here's the, the, the final step here that gets the US firmly in this idea of containment. And it is our support of um, freedom and a democratic form of government in Greece and to prevent Turkey from falling to the Soviet Union as well. Now, we're not going to be sending the military but what we do send is financial support to help Greece and Turkey. So if we think about this long history of the Cold War, it starts with financial support. 
allowing other countries to defend themselves. So um, there was a, there were pockets of, of communist support throughout Greece. The US is going to support the others in Greece who would you know, suppress this type of, uh, of action. So this is financial support for the Greek civil war, financial support for Turkey to prevent the Soviets from coming in. So this is the first step and a very, very strong example of containment. Containment does not have to involve force. It can involve monetary influence and that's gonna be very critical. Um, and then we formalize this into the Truman Doctrine. So Truman, you know, to, to make sure that the money is appropriated from the legislature to be given to Greece and Turkey, he goes before the, uh, the Congress and he issues this, you know, this speech that we call the Truman Doctrine. Look at this quote. If we falter in our leadership, we may endanger the peace of the world. He's saying we are not going to go forward with appeasement. And he also says that we will go anywhere in the world, anytime to fight communism. So look at the headlines here of the New York Times. Truman acts to save the nations from red rule. Red is referencing communist rule and asks for $400 million to aid Greece and Turkey. Congress fight likely, but approval is seen. And so, yes, there's opposition. Some people are saying, I don't know, that's a lot of money. But he is intimating that if this doesn't happen, you're actually endangering the United States. So the money is appropriated and we are well entrenched now in the Truman Doctrine. So the Truman Doctrine is containment. This is the new foreign policy. Monroe Doctrine was about we stay out of your affairs, you stay out of our affairs. Truman Doctrine is saying we are going to involve ourselves in everybody's affairs if it means stopping the spread of communism. All right, so make sure that you're clear on that transition in foreign policy. We are also going to act this out in trying to protect Western European countries, actually any European country. We were offering economic aid to get them back on, on track for production because Truman knows that global trade is the key to success here. So the, uh, notice the, the cartoon here. So this is about the Marshall Plan, which was offering all of this money to countries to help them to repair their infrastructure and become productive once again. So this is going to, to be a little bit different than the Dawes Plan. The Dawes Plan was more or less a loan that we expected to be paid back. This is a little bit different. The Marshall Plan is about infusing the money so that we can ultimately begin trading with these other countries as well. All right, so notice the, the cartoon, American taxpayer, that's where the Marshall Plan money is coming from. And they're headed towards self-support and the US is giving that money, uh, the Marshall Plan, right? Which is going to help to stabilize Europe. Um, notice how much money we're talking about, $13 billion. And it was about increasing industrial production because if other countries are producing industrially, People have money, they're buying goods. The U.S. is the largest producer. It's going to allow um, more purchases of American-made products. All right, so when this Marshall Plan money is offered up, the Western European countries say, sure, we will take this. We need assistance. We need to get back on track. Stalin would not allow the Eastern European countries under his control with the um, um, satellite states to access any of the cash. So look at the breakdown. You can see with the bars on each country, the proportion of the Marshall Plan money that was accepted. So you've got Great Britain, of course, and France um, accepting large portions of this. Here's Germany. Here is West Germany. Here is East Germany. So remember those zones, the four occupation zones that were set up? The zones that were not the Soviet zones were getting Marshall Plan money. So now we have within one nation, we have part of the nation being able to rebuild, revitalize itself, and we have the other part of the nation that is definitely restricted. Here are Greece and Turkey receiving Marshall Plan money as well as part of the effort to fight uh, communism. So these countries are forbidden by the Soviet Union to receive Marshall Plan money. And it definitely creates a division and, and a, um, a difference between 
the economic stability of Eastern Europe versus Western Europe, okay? Stalin is upset because even Berlin is divided. West Berlin, the city of Berlin is getting assistance, Marshall Plan assistance, East Berlin is not. So that would definitely be a problem. Can you imagine if there were a natural disaster in Marietta and part of Marietta was receiving government assistance to rebuild and repair and uh, help those in need and part of the city was not? That would probably be um, very difficult to maintain. So Stalin tries to cut off transportation. He's going to cut off transportation by train and by road uh, to all of these cities within Western Germany, uh, West Berlin. Um, and that's going to be a problem, trying to get supplies to those people. But go back to the Truman Doctrine. We will do anything, anywhere to stop the spread of communism. So the Berlin airlift is the response. So the Berlin blockade is where the Soviet Union prevents the um, United States from providing supplies or support to West Berlin, a city within the Soviet zone of influence. And to do this, the Berlin airlift, we're going to use airspace rather than using the, the trains and um, the roads to get into Berlin, we're just gonna fly in. So we fly into an airport. The airport happens to be in the American part of the city of Berlin. So we're going to fly airplanes in. And as we're flying in, even over the Eastern part of Berlin, we're going to drop supplies and we're going or into uh, West, Ber West Berlin. We're gonna be dropping supplies to make sure that everybody has what they need. So notice the, the volume of flights, over 600 flights per day are coming in with everything they need because um, Stalin is trying to basically suffocate West Berlin and force them into his hands by not allowing access to any goods into Berlin. So the US and the Berlin airlift, we're going to be sending food, we're going to be sending medical supplies, everything you can imagine is brought into the airport uh, and dropped into West Berlin. Here is the coordination with that many planes leaving and arriving in Berlin. Um, you've got to see just this massive coordination at elevation and timing between planes so that there is not a log jam. All right, here are some children and they are waving to these planes. And what they're hoping is that the pilot that's flying over Berlin at that time was what was known as the candy bomber. And there um, began to be these pilots that, you know, they were, you know, dis dissatisfied with, you know, how things were going. And they were worried about the kids who have suffered so much during World War II. So they wrapped some candy into a handkerchief and just dropped it out the window. And these kids, they started to hope, oh, well, I hope we're going to get candy today. And so it became a thing where a lot of pilots um, began to, to drop candy out of their airplane to the kids and they became known as the candy bombers and so here you can see the kids waving to the plane in the Berlin airlift. All right another effort to try to protect those Western European countries from further expansion is the formation of an alliance NATO or the North Atlantic Treaty Organization and initially there were 12 countries that were part of the um, original NATO alliance that has expanded over time. And notice that it is a true military alliance. An attack on one is an attack on them all. What would George Washington think of the NATO alliance? He probably would have disagreed because you'll remember in his farewell address, he said that we should not entangle ourselves in the affairs of other countries. But you've got to look at his view in the 1700s versus this view in the new atomic age of the 1900s. And um, there's a, a vast difference in what the world is like and the globalization. Um, so NATO becomes the uh, alliance of these Western European countries. Stalin is also going to have his own alliance of the Eastern European countries that will be called the Warsaw Pact. So we can see these 12 countries in blue were the original 12 countries that were part of NATO. Then later on, we can see others that will join in, okay? So by the 1950s, Greece and Turkey 
join in with NATO. And then we've got Germany that's joining in. And then by the 1980s and 90s, um, we're going to see other countries that will join. This is at the time of the collapse of the Cold War and the hold over these Soviet satellite states. And eventually these independent countries that form in 1991, um, they are going to join NATO as well. All right, here is the response to NATO. We've got the Warsaw Pact. So these countries that are in kind of this gold color, they will be the alliance with the Soviet Union. So we're in a standoff. Soviet Union has their alliance. United States has their alliance in Western Europe. So it's NATO versus the Warsaw Pact. And um, this is going to, to make for a very, very tense situation in Europe. And again, keep in mind that there is this division here between East Germany and West Germany. Now, later on is when the Berlin Wall is going to be constructed between the two parts of Berlin because Berlin, the city of Berlin remains a divided city. So even throughout the Cold War, when East Germany is a Soviet bloc state, Berlin, West Berlin is a free part of a city within that country. So there's going to be a lot of, um, of um, support for West Berlin throughout the Cold War. So it's a standoff between Joseph Stalin and Harry Truman and the two alliances that have formed. Okay, there's also a recommendation by the uh, United States National Security Advisors that we have got to build up our military, that this idea of containment of communism is going to be expensive and we have got to make sure that we expand our military and that we need to do so in this massive buildup because they are firmly believing that there's going to be some sort of retaliation, some sort of uh, Soviet response to try to, to gain more influence. So here is the author. Um, and it's going to increase defense spending. So look at how much more money we're going to be spending per year on military development, military weapons, military equipment. Um, so NSC stands for National Security Council. And so NSC 68 is the document that is talking about further expansion of atomic weapons, further expansion of military equipment, and that that needs to be a financial priority for the United States above all else. Okay, and we're gonna read a portion of that here in class as well. So this is shifting the approach from the Marshall Plan where Marshall Plan was about infusing money into Western Europe to defend those areas. Now we're going to be shifting that expenditure, that money to the development of our own nuclear arsenal and our own weaponry. And this really starts the arms race. Um, by now, we've got word that the Soviet Union has their own bomb, um, potentially more powerful than our atomic bomb. So we've got to up the game and um, have our military equipment a little bit more powerful. Look at this cartoon. So we've got the H-bomb, which is representing the hydrogen bomb. And, you know, the atomic bomb it was sometimes referred to as the A-bomb. So they're kind of making light of this, that it's just going to be one after the other, where if they have a hydrogen bomb, then so do we. Then we develop a Y bomb, then so do they. Then, you know, it's just this constant back and forth. And the power and the arsenal of these nuclear weapons could completely wipe out um, everybody, or all of our enemies, you know, with a fraction of what is being stockpiled. And we know that our enemy has that at their disposal as well. So if we use that type of weapon against them, there's going to be a massive retaliation against us and it's going to wipe us out at the same time. So what they end up having to use are just very primitive types of weapons because neither side is willing to provoke the other with this nuclear weapon. So it was almost like um, it was a, a way of deterring a nuclear war by having the ability to annihilate one another on both sides. So it's a very delicate, complex situation. Meanwhile, uh, in the Pacific, we've got efforts for reconstructing Japan. Uh, remember that the war in the Pacific ended in August of 1945. And the United States and uh, military commander Douglas MacArthur remain in control and occupy Japan in the effort to, to change up the government there, change up the economy, the US is taking control. 
Now I wanna share with you um, a different document. This was actually one of your classmates, Emma Reiser. Her great grandmother was part of one of the, the women's auxiliary forces in World War II. And they um, have a copy of the surrender document that the Japanese signed at the end of World War II. I think it's an interesting document and she shared a copy of it with me. So if we go through here, it talks about that the, um, that the military command on behalf of the emperor is surrendering and they go through um, the, um, you know, recommendation and basically telling the, the Japanese people to, to cease and desist, the war is over and there is a surrender. So then it's signed by the, um, the military commander on behalf of the emperor and then it's signed by Douglas MacArthur. Um, then, and I believe that would be Chester Nimitz's um, signature as well. He was the main um, naval officer at Midway, Battle of Midway in the Pacific as well. So it looks like he was there at the same time. So then it goes forward and it talks about, you know, Hirohito, the Emperor Hirohito is explaining, yes, I'm the Emperor and this is what I want. and uh, he signs as well. So then you've got the document here in Japanese and just more of the explanation of what's being signed. So I think it's kind of interesting here that, um, you know, he, he is signing this and saying that the, the war is over. So I think this is a, an interesting document and I greatly appreciate Emma sharing this with us. So now that the war is over in Japan, there's got to be monitoring going on there. And that's gonna be with military occupation. So MacArthur and the American forces are continuing to occupy Japan during this reconstruction process. Keep in mind where they're located, okay? So Japan is right off the coast of China and Korea, all right? There is a Chinese civil war that also kicks up at the same time. So this Chinese Civil War had actually begun much, much earlier than World War II. And it was between this uh, communist leader, Mao Zedong, and Chiang Kai-shek, who is the nationalist representative. Now, his, he's also referred, referred to as Jiang Jeshi. It's the same guy. So here's Jiang Jeshi. More often in the United States, he's referred to as Chiang Kai-shek. Um, same person. Here's Mao Zedong, who is the communist representative. So they had been fighting in a um, civil war throughout the early 1930s. But then when the Japanese invaded Manchuria and then moved down the coastline into Nanjing, that was during the Chinese Civil War. So think about if during the American Civil War, an outside nation invaded the United States in the midst of the Confederacy fighting the Union. So that's what's happening here in the Chinese Civil War, where you've got the, the people within China who are fighting a war over communism versus an, a nationalist form of government um, interrupted by an outside invasion of Japan. So they, they, they basically took a time out in their civil war, united as a united China to fight in World War II against the Japanese. Again, remember that they came in on the side of the allies, but now that the world that World War II is over, they pick up where they left off and the Chinese Civil War starts up again. The United States is um, supporting Chiang Kai-shek, obviously, because again, remember that Truman doctor, doctrine, we're going to try to stop the spread of communism. Um, here's the problem. The United States is providing financial support for Chiang Kai-shek and the, the resources that are spent that are sent to Chiang Kai-shek are not used in a way that are um, efficient. The people of China are, you know, they've struggled during World War II. They have struggled during the Great Depression. Their financial needs are not being met. They're in trouble. Mao is devoting a lot of his resources to the poverty level and the, the lower classes in China. That's not always where the funding that the United States is providing to Chiang Kai-shek is going. And so as a result, Mao and the communists went out in the Chinese Civil War and Chiang Kai-shek is going to leave the Chinese mainland 
take control of the island of Taiwan, set up a government there. Um, now, the United States does not formally recognize and acknowledge that Mao is the true and legitimate leader of China. So this, this communist government that set up the People's Republic of China that Mao creates um, is not initially recognized and accepted as a legitimate government by the United States or by um, members of uh, NATO. That's gonna be something to pay attention to as well later on. So you've really kind of got two different governments that are existing and claiming to be the rightful leaders of China. Korea is also um, in the crosshairs of um, the, the early stages of the Cold War because this was also a territory, you'll remember that the Japanese had taken over. So once World War II ends, Korea is going to go back to being an independent nation, but the Soviet Union wants it to be a communist nation and the United States wants it to be a non-communist nation. So they come up with um, a deal where they're going to temporarily divide uh, Korea into two different regions. They're gonna divide it at the 38th line of latitude. So you've got North Korea that's going to be controlled by, and, and um, it's almost like what they've done with Germany where they've divided it into zones of occupation. They're gonna divide Korea into zones of occupation. Um, the communist, which will be led by Kim Il-sung will be in charge of North Korea. Now, if you look at uh, North Korea today, we know that Kim Jong-un is uh, the leader. He is, I believe, the great-grandson of Kim Il-sung, who is the main um, leader here at the end of World War II. Then South Korea is going to be non-communist, provided with resources by the United States, and they're going to be led by Syngman Rhee. So there's a, a, a pretty tense standoff between the two regions. And this 38th line of latitude is this line of demarcation between the two, right? So there's you know, supposed to be this, this buffer zone between the line of latitude that neither side will cross, okay? Look what happens. Um, the United States and South Koreans are going to be attacked by the North Koreans in June of 1950. Truman is still president at this time. And um, so the attack is going to happen. But remember that Douglas MacArthur is still in Japan with this rebuilding effort. So the soldiers that MacArthur has with him in Japan at this time are not necessarily combat soldiers. They are more occupation soldiers that are working in the rebuilding efforts um, following the war. So when the North Korean attack happens in June of 1950, Douglas MacArthur is going to be put in charge of a United Nations authorized force to go in and, and counterattack against the North Koreans. And they're going to go in behind enemy lines because very quickly the North Koreans blasted through the 38th line of latitude and pressed the South Korean forces and the American forces kind of in the Southeast corner of Korea at a, a port city called Pusan. So what MacArthur's going to do is come in behind him enemy lines with this United Nations um, um, military. Now, yes, there are other countries involved in this UN force, but it was mostly American forces involved here. So he goes in at Incheon. That's how I remember that. He goes in at Incheon, which was behind where the North Koreans had, had fought. And so then the North Koreans fight back and they get back to where they started before with this division between the 38th line of latitude. So now Truman has a decision to make. Do you continue to press farther north and eliminate the communist control of North Korea or do you just accept the division at the 38th line of latitude? So Truman is um, kind of reluctant to go further, but he's getting pressure from Douglas MacArthur saying that now is the chance to go for further. And if we look back at the map here, all right, notice that North Korea is bordered with China. Truman was worried that if the United States forces blast beyond the 38th line of latitude and, and begin to attack here in North Korea to unify Korean, Korea in a non-communist regime, Truman was worried by 1950 because Mao is now in charge in China that China would supplement and support the North Koreans and come in um, and it would start another world war. 
MacArthur convinces Truman that that would never happen because Mao is a brand new leader. He has newly um, taken control of China. And the last thing he would do would be get involved in this war with the United States. Um, MacArthur's kind of looking at this in the way that we saw Vladimir Lenin kind of back out of World War I when he first won the Bolshevik Revolution within the Soviet Union. The last thing he wants to do is continue to fight in World War I because that could potentially weak his, weaken his leadership. That's what MacArthur's banking on will happen here. So Truman, you know, he's getting a lot of pressure from MacArthur. He listens to his military commander and they blast forward into North Korea. And guess what happens? Here come the Chinese across the border. They push back and then things get um, basically back to where they were before. And we're kind of in a stalemate, heavy, heavy fighting on both sides. Nobody really, really gaining much of an advantage. So here's that port city of Pusan where the North Koreans had blasted through. They had trapped the Americans and the South Korean forces here. MacArthur comes in at Incheon behind enemy lines to lure them back. And then that's when he convinces Truman to go further. The Chinese come in and then all bets are off. So look at this animated um, timeline. So we've got the trapping at Pusan. Here comes MacArthur. They're back where they started. They move forward. Here come the Chinese. And now we're back where we started. But look at the timing. We're just now uh, to 1951. So we continue from 1951 to 52 to 53, and nothing is changing here because it is just heavy, heavy fighting between the US-led South Korean forces and the North Korean forces supported by China and indirectly the Soviet Union. So where we talk about the Cold War being the standoff between the United States and the Soviet Union, isn't this indirectly a conflict between the Soviets and the United States? It is. So sometimes we see the Cold War warming up in certain areas or becoming hot when you have a military standoff. So the Korean War is, um, is going to last for a number of years, right? So notice where this is, is headed. Uh, through 1950 is where most of the action takes place. Then we've got uh, 51, 52, and then ultimately 53, eventually the ceasefire is signed. So this heavy fighting, again, it's expensive. We've got all of these other issues that we're trying to maintain around the world. So um, MacArthur is challenging Truman and blames him for the, the situation where it, it ended up not being successful in this blast into North Korea, and he openly criticizes Truman. So MacArthur says that, you know, we can't surrender. We have to, to finish this job. This has totally been mismanaged by, Macar by uh, Harry Truman. Truman fired MacArthur for insubordination. The president of the United States is the highest ranking commander in the military forces. Even though MacArthur is a general, well-respected general from his efforts in the Pacific part of World War II, Truman fires him for challenging the decisions by the president. That was also pretty damaging to Truman because you've got this popular war hero that's now being fired by the American president. Um, keep in mind, 1952 is an election year. So in this election year, Eisenhower is going to win the presidency. Eisenhower comes in, um, he's got zero political background, but he is a popular war hero. So he comes in, we know that the um, um, negotiations that Truman was involved in, Truman wanted to end the war, wanted to negotiate a peace settlement. And that's where MacArthur got angry that you couldn't have um, a victory or have peace without actually getting a victory. Um, Eisenhower comes in and there are a couple of changes in 1952, late 1952, that really lead us to the ceasefire. One is that Eisenhower comes in as president and Eisenhower hints that he might be willing to use nuclear force to end the war in Korea. Now, we don't know whether he would have actually done that, but given his background as the mastermind of the D-Day invasion, 
his uh, role as the Supreme Commander of the Allied Forces in World War II, when he's suggesting that he might be willing to use nuclear force, you have to pay attention to that. The other thing that happens in the Soviet Union is that Joseph Stalin died. When Stalin died, there is disruption within the Soviet leadership as to who's going to replace him because there was no clear line of succession. When he dies, it's not like a vice president steps in. You're going to have conflict among the leaders of the Soviet Union trying to figure out who will now take over. So with that uncertainty in the Soviet Union and with this new American president who is a more militaristic type of president, there's the surrender, okay? Or the ceasefire, not a surrender, but a ceasefire in 1953. A ceasefire means we're gonna quit the fighting, but they've not totally resolved the issues between the two sides. We are still under a ceasefire in Korea. So this was in 1953, it is now 2021, and there is still a ceasefire between North Korea and South Korea. There are still American forces that are um, patrolling and monitoring the 38th line of latitude that divides North and South Korea. And we know that the relationship between the United States and North Korea has been quite tense over the past few years. Um, so this is where it all starts. Let's look at these long-term results. There was never a war declaration, okay? So this was part of the containment process that we increased military spending. The soldiers went in to fight in Korea under the United Nations umbrella. So our legislature never declared war. And that's something to keep in mind because this sets a precedent of what's going to happen with Vietnam. So troops were sent there without a declaration of war and they were there for years, heavy, heavy casualties. Um, massive spending on this war in Korea there's also another alliance that is formed, CETO, the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization. And it's essentially, when we look at the Korean War, it is an element of the Cold War that's indirectly about this rivalry between the United States and the Soviet Union. Sometimes the Korean War kind of gets lost because it's between World War II and Vietnam that becomes such um, you know, powerful, uh, important areas of concern. Korean War is in between. It's in the 1950s. And I think sometimes people forget about it or overlook about it, overlook it. Sometimes it's referred to as the Forgotten War. Um, but we're not going to forget about the Korean War because it was incredibly important in these steps during the Cold War. Here is the Korean War Memorial in Washington, D.C. Uh, and you've got these soldiers that are patrolling through the, the vegetation supposedly simulating what was happening in Korea in the Korean War. If you go and visit this, I highly encourage you and visit this one at night. I mean, each one of these soldiers is illuminated and it's just absolutely um, incredible to see this at, at night. And then notice the statement here, freedom is not free. That this, that's the whole idea of containment, that allowing um, and, and preventing the spread of communism is preserving freedom around the world and there has to be sacrifices to make that happen. All right, so that is a long discussion of time or of uh, that first section, but let's move into the second section here of the Cold War where we're beginning to look at how we approach this internally. So um, there is still, even with this expansion of military spending uh, and globalization, there is still a very, very strong commitment by the Democratic Party and Harry Truman to preserve the New Deal and this idea of modern liberalism um, and the welfare state where the government is taking responsibility for the welfare of individual citizens. But at the same time, there is also a commitment to containment, which is going to be expensive. So there's gonna kind of have to be this tug of war over finances. Um, so the, the modern or the, the liberal policies, some people wanna kind of scale this back a little bit in order to put more emphasis on fighting communism. And that's gonna be kind of this fracturing that's going to happen within the Democratic Party as we will see in just a second. 
So when we keep using these terms, liberal versus conservative, I want you to make sure that you understand how they differ. Um, they agree on what you're trying to achieve, and that's going to be freedom and prosperity and safety for everybody in the United States. The difference is how you make that happen. A liberal believes that the government plays a much greater role in achieving those, those goals. A conservative believes that too much government involvement is actually taking away freedom and taking away the ability to prosper as we would want. So this wants less government involvement, this wants more government involvement. So it's about how you achieve those goals. Um, one of the other outcomes here with this emphasis on uh, globalization and the Cold War, there is also a change in the, um, um, the view of labor unions and the, um, the Taft-Hartley Act is going to be passed. So remember that Truman is a Republican and he's going to come in and some of the Republicans in the House of Representatives that had regained control in uh, 1952, they are also going to be part of this kind of scaling back the liberalism and swinging it more towards the conservative side. And the Taft-Hartley Act is going to limit the power of labor unions, all right? So I would say that again, that labor unions lose power under the Taft-Hartley Act. So when the Republicans come back in and their conservative ideas come in, um, they are going to limit labor unions because again, they get equated with radicalism and there's this fear of, of communism spreading. So the Taft-Hartley Act, look at this cartoon. So the collective bargaining, which is what we mean by union strikes is smashed by the, um, the Taft-Hartley Act. And so the Republicans are containing labor. Uh, Truman tries to veto it when they first, when they're first in before uh, Eisenhower comes in, but they are going to override his veto and Taft-Hartley is put in place anyway. So please understand this is a law that is going to restrict labor. So we've kind of swung two different ways during the, the early period of the leading into the Gilded Age with the rise of big business, the labor unions never won in those power struggles between the businesses and the labor when it in, in some cases turned violent. Then we saw in the progressive era that it began to change and uh, swung in the favor of labor. And now we're seeing things swing back in um, uh, favor of the businesses, okay? So this is the fracturing that I talked about with this New Deal coalition. Um, the, the party had been really bringing together lots of different groups. You had the Southern Democrats, you had people who were very progressive, um, and you had the traditional liberal uh, Democrats that were all wound together in what we call the New Deal coalition. A coalition is where you group people together. That starts to, to kind of unravel a little bit in 1948 where we see um, the Southern Democrats that are saying, you know, we're not happy about the, um, the executive order that Roosevelt has put in place that is going to be allowing African-Americans free hiring practices. Then the progressives are upset because Taft-Hartley has been passed. And so, um, and then you've got the traditional Democrats that are still going to follow with Harry Truman. So it fractures and you've got the Democratic Party that splits and there are three different candidates that used to all be aligned with one Democratic candidate. Now, when we've seen this happen before, not even splitting three ways, but when we've seen a party split two ways, it typically will allow the opposite leader to come in to office. Um, most of the people in 1948 didn't think that Harry Truman had a chance of winning because they saw that he would lose the Southern vote to Strom Thurmond and the Dixiecrats, um, also called the state's rights party, but typically you'll see it referred to as the Dixiecrats, uh, Henry Wallace and those progressive uh, reformers. So people thought no chance at all that Thomas, I mean, uh, that Harry Truman would win, that Thomas Dewey, the Republican would easily win the election. Well, Harry Truman just set out to prove them wrong. He campaigns, you know, one city after the other, um, and then on election night, look what happens. Truman ends up winning, okay? He loses the, the Deep South as we had expected with the state's rights party. Um, then um, um, the Republican Thomas Dewey, again, with this idea of 
conservatism and, and economic conservatism will win the, the North. Um, so when we, and then the progressive party under Wallace doesn't really carry any of the states, but people had discounted um, Harry Truman. Look what the Chicago newspaper had done. They had tried to scoop the other competing newspapers with going ahead and printing the story that Thomas Dewey had won the election. But they did that before the results were actually in, in an effort to sell newspapers. And there's Harry Truman, very famous photograph of him holding that up and just laughing at the fact that everyone had discounted him, but he won. But during 1948, uh, through um, his the end of his term in 52, that's when the Korean War picks up. That's when we see other issues beginning to arise that will cause him to not win in 1952. He had run on this promise of a fair deal. And notice what he is promoting here. Every segment of our population and every individual has a right to expect from our government a fair deal. Um, the conservatives are not happy about this. So the conservatives, um, and that would also include the states' rights, Democrats in the South. This is the part that they're upset. Civil rights legislation is part of his fair deal program. Um, but then he wants to expand social security, make minimum wage higher, national health insurance. So these are all going to be expensive programs that are very liberal. And that, excuse me, loses part of the conservative um, faction of his government, I mean, of uh, his party. There's also the Red Scare, very, very powerful. This is very similar to what we saw in the first Red Scare, where there's this effort to root out people who are trying to tear down the government. A couple of important actions where we talked about Sacco and Vanzetti being kind of the key example of a Red Scare incident in uh, after World War I. Red Scare in World War II is going to largely be about uh, loyalty, and there will be requirements that if you have a job in the federal government, you've got to sign a new loyalty oath. We've already talked about some of those loyalty oaths in the first Red Scare. They become even more widespread in the second Red Scare. So notice this cartoon, the red iceberg. So an iceberg can destroy a ship. Here's the United States kind of in smooth sailing. But if they hit that red iceberg that already has taken, notice the gravestones here, it's already taking control of China, already taking control of Czechoslovakia, North Korea, East Germany, Hungary, Poland. Um, who's next, right? Who's going to run into this iceberg next? The Smith Act is also about um, educators trying to make sure that they are not disloyal and trying to brainwash students. This is really the, the key feature in the second Red Scare, which is going to be this committee in the House of Representatives that will hold hearings to identify communists living and working among Americans. Um, they target famous Americans, movie stars, uh, radio personalities, people who are celebrities are brought before the House Committee on Un-American Activities and questioned. Um, and if you're brought in and questioned, even if you're not guilty, just the suspicion around you in Hollywood could sometimes blacklist you, meaning that if there was a part coming up in a movie, you might be overlooked for that part because there was suspicion around you because you had been brought before HUAC, as it was called. The Hollywood 10, these are a group of producers and directors in uh, Hollywood that are suspected of subversion. They're brought before HUAC and they refuse to testify. And that's going to, to cause a lot of, um, of anxiety among the, the you know, celebrities and the stars there. And so notice what it's saying, free the Hollywood 10, demand a presidential pardon. Um, so these actions, these, activ these um, investigations were widely publicized. And you also need to remember that in the 1950s is when we start to see television becoming more popular. So where a lot of, you know, the Scopes trial and everything was broadcast on the radio, a lot of the HUAC activity is being broadcast on television and it made for a very exciting um, entertainment, which it was you know, kind of tragic in the way that it was being implemented. So notice this cartoon on the left. This is a, a pretty famous one. The um, artist here, his name is Herb Block. And um, 
you know, or he runs his name together in one word, Herb Locke. And you're going to see a lot of Herb Locke cartoons during the 1950s and 1960s because he is believing that the House Committee on Un-American Activities is going way too far with their investigation beyond what is constitutional. So where we saw Thomas Nast kind of be the cartoonist of the 1890s and the 19, early 1900s, Herb Locke is going to be the cartoonist of the 1950s and 1960s. So notice this car that's driving recklessly on the sidewalk and everybody's just getting mowed over. And it says, it's okay, we're hunting communists. So it doesn't matter if we trample on you and endanger you, as long as we're doing something that is to protect the nation, it's okay. Where might they have gotten this idea from? Yep, let's go back to the Supreme Court with Shank and that ruling about a clear and present danger, the ruling in Korematsu. Clearly the Supreme Court favors this idea of national security and that individual rights can take a back seat to that. And so this is what Herb Locke is trying to show is that the same sort of um, kind of challenge to constitutional rights is dangerous and it's being ignored. There are a couple of really great spy cases that are important in the 1950s. And I would draw, draw your attention to these. The first one is the Alger Hiss case. And Alger Hiss is one of the close uh, advisors to Franklin Roosevelt during World War II. He was um, um, an expert in foreign policy. He was at the Yalta Conference. He was the one who actually designed the structure for the new United Nations, what the organization was gonna look like, who had which powers, who's going to be involved. Alger Hiss was the guy. And everybody knew who Alger Hiss was. Um, there was a guy who was charged with being a spy and he comes forward and when he's questioned, he says, yep, I did it, I was a spy. And he admits it. But what he does is they say, okay, who did you get your information from that you're giving to the Soviet Union? And Whitaker Chambers, here he is, he's the guy who admits to being a spy in the United States who provided information to the Soviets. And they ask him, who gave you information? And he names off some people. And one of the persons that he named was Alger Hiss. And people were like, wait a minute, Alger Hiss, he's about as close as you can get to the American president. There is no way that he was giving away American secrets to you to turn over to the Soviet Union. And so Whitaker Chambers, says, well, I've got proof of this. I've got evidence of this. And uh, they bring Alger Hiss before the HUAC committee. Here he is on the right testifying and everybody's watching. And he denies having any sort of connection to Whitaker Chambers or anybody else, you know, says he doesn't know him, all that business. So they go back to Whitaker Chambers and they said, okay, you, you've got proof. What's your proof? And he said, well, if you go back to my house and he was from somewhere in the Midwest, and lived on a pumpkin farm. And he said, you know, the, the pumpkins stay out in the field, the ones that aren't harvested and they rot every year. Um, I hid some canisters of film and film would be like what you put in the camera at that time. And it was, you know, it was in a, a, a spool and you threaded it through the camera and, and that's where the exposures of what uh, the image was that you were taking would be on this film. And he said, I've got some canisters of film where I hollowed out some pumpkins in the field behind my house. And there are some canisters of film that have documents that I received from Alger Hiss. And they're like, what? So the investigators, they go out to Whitaker Chambers house. They start, you know, just diving through all these rotten pumpkins out in the field. And what do you know, they find out, they find some hollowed out pumpkins that have film that has information on it that only Alger Hiss would have had available to him. So, I mean, it was just stunning that all of this was, was happening. Now, initially, when Whitaker Chambers said it was Alger Hiss who did it, and people were like, whatever, this is crazy. You're a spy. Why should we believe you or trust you? Most people on the committee were willing to just kind of say, all right, that's it. We're done. But there was one guy who was brand new. He was a, you know, a, like a freshman representative from California who had just recently been, re -elect, been elected and was on this committee and it was Richard Nixon. And so this was very early in Richard Nixon's career. 
Nobody had ever heard of him outside of his own little community in California that had elected him there. And he kept pressing the point. He's the one that was pressing, where did you get this information? I got it from a pumpkin, oh my gosh. And when all of this gets exposed, who is the hero? It's Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon was thought at this time to be someone who had saved the United States from this dangerous spy who had infiltrated the highest levels of government. So this became kind of a, a launching pad for Richard Nixon's national political career. Keep that in mind. Okay, another one of the spy cases involves Julius and Ethel Rosenberg. Julius was a very low level scientist who was working on the Manhattan Project um, and Ethel was his wife and he was charged with turning over uh, documents related to the development of the atomic bomb to the Soviet Union. So when they're brought in and questioned, they question them separately and neither one of them is admitting to anything. They don't know anything about it. They had nothing to do with it. Well, they started trying to play Julius against Ethel and they say, you know, Ethel is in the other room and, um, you know, she's implicated in this. You can save her life if you, because what's the, the punishment for treason? It's death. So if, if you um, tell us what you did, then it could spare Ethel's life. And then they tell Ethel the same thing about Julius. You know, if, if you know something about this, that you can tell us, then we can spare your life, blah, 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 because they had a couple of, of young children. And so the thought of both of them being executed for their role in any espionage would have left their children orphans. And so they believed that playing one off of the other, that they would crack. Neither one of them ever cracked. Ultimately, they were executed. The Rosenbergs were executed. Um, and it touched off this firestorm that this was actually de discrimination that they had been targeted because they were Jewish. And this was a, a very, very controversial case as well in the 1950s. Later on, much later in the 1990s, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, there was kind of this opening of archival records to people of both sides. So we opened up American archives to Soviet researchers. The Soviet Union opened up Soviet archives to American researchers. And as there, and it was called the Vernona Project. And so as American researchers were going through a lot of the documentation with the Vernona Project, there was documentation that proved that indeed Julius was involved in providing secrets to the Soviet Union. Not as much evidence connecting Ethel to any of this, but Julius was implicated um, with, with pretty high certainty that he was involved. But at the time, they didn't have that conclusive evidence. So these are two examples of very, very famous spy cases that had the, the country was just riveted on this. So in walks Joseph McCarthy. He is, again, a new senator who is coming in uh, to, to office, and he has big dreams of um, national power. And he saw that Richard Nixon had gained enormous popularity by hunting communists. So Joe McCarthy believes that he can kind of, you know, create this national recognition for himself by doing the same thing. The problem is there's no evidence to support the claims that Joe McCarthy is issuing. So he starts giving these very passionate speeches. You know, he waves around papers saying that he's got lists of hundreds of federal employees who are spies. And when they ask him to name them, the number constantly is changing and he'll tell one lie in one speech and then it doesn't match up with a lie that he tells in another speech. And it's just that he's having to lie more and more and more to cover his tracks. And it's just a complete mess. Um, Joe McCarthy, his downfall is going to be when he accuses military commanders of being spies and subversive. And there are going to be hearings on live television where McCarthy's like, yeah, here's my chance to get some national publicity. And he is on TV. You've got these war heroes from World War II that are sitting there listening to Joe McCarthy tell them and accuse them of being traitors. And he bullies 
these military men and they are very calm in their demeanor. They're saying, we didn't do it. There's no evidence. There's no proof. Show us the proof because there is no proof for McCarthy to show. And he starts spinning his wheels. He's contradicting himself. And his treatment of these military leaders is horrible and it backfires and people turn on Joe McCarthy and he is exposed as a fraud when he goes after um, the, the army commanders and this. And so we begin to call it McCarthyism. And when we use the term McCarthyism or a McCarthy witch hunt, what you're talking about is charges or accusations that are not based on any evidence, that it is just these wild accusations to gain publicity for yourself, okay? Um, we could think, and when, when they're referred to as witch hunts, that's trying to connect this to what happened in the Salem witch trials where people were making these wild accusations that really didn't um, have any sort of basis for, for evidence. So Joe McCarthy and the um, McCarthyism, this is going to kind of calm down the Red Scare because it's just gotten out of control and after Joe McCarthy is exposed as a fraud, people don't want to be tied up in that. So they kind of back off this very public attack on um, subversive activity. Now, it doesn't completely go away, but it just it makes it um, less glorified in the media and it just kind of um, backs it off just a little bit. 1952 is an election year. So this is the election where Eisenhower is going to be elected. Notice who he chooses as his running mate. So here, who else would you love to lead the nation in 1952, but the hero of World War II, Dwight Eisenhower, who has zero political experience, and Richard Nixon, the man who has helped to root out communism within the government. So they win in a landslide, except in the Deep South. How come? Yes, because these states are still solidly supporting the Democratic Party because of their resistance to Reconstruction and the end of the Civil War. So Eisenhower, while he's president, as we know, he's going to end up threatening nuclear force in the Korean War. We've already mentioned that when we discussed Korea. We kind of fast forwarded, then we backed up, and now we've moved forward again. Um, and he is going to try to bring back conservatism. So think about what we're doing. The Republicans are bringing back this conservative approach. He wants to take apart some of the New Deal, thinking that it's gone too far in creating that welfare state. All right, so Eisenhower as president, uh, we've got the nuclear weapons buildup, massive retaliation, mutually assured destruction. We've already discussed this. Of course, Eisenhower is wanting to commit large sums of money to the weapons development program. Here is the new leader who finally emerges in the Soviet Union, Nikita Khrushchev, and he is going to be a complex individual, as we will see. Um, and he's kind of got a, um, a strained relationship with Eisenhower as well. They start off maybe trying to, to calm things down a little bit, but then things escalate and get much more uh, tense. 1956, easily reelected again, except for the Deep South, that is not going to vote for a Republican. Not that they don't like Eisenhower, it's just that they don't like the Republican Party. All right, so then in this third part, we are going to be looking at how other countries in, in the world, not as developed or as industrialized, are going to be part of this effort in the Cold War to gain support on each side. So we've got what we call first world countries, second world countries, and third world countries. First world countries would be more industrialized nations. Second world countries would be emerging industrial nations. And then third world countries are still developing. They are pretty unstable politically and they don't have a lot of economic resources at their disposal. So with the Cold War kind of stalling out and everything being equal, the focus becomes the third world countries and trying to bring some of these areas into your um, sphere, right? So the United States as a superpower wants to get third world countries under their umbrella. Soviet Union wants to get third world countries under their umbrella because as they emerge eventually as to uh, being industrial powers, this is going to be a place that trade is going to be an opportunity. So we see new um, 
organizations, right? We've already talked about CETO, Southeast Asia Treaty Organization. We've got NATO. We're going to have other um, uh, alliances made as well. CENTO, which is the Central Treaty Organization with the Central uh, Nations. And then we've also got the international, the um, Inter-American Treaty Organization. So it's all working together. Now, also in the 1950s, the military industrial complex is created. And this is where we're going to see a very strong alignment with private defense companies, companies that build planes, companies that build um, military equipment. They are privately owned companies. They're going to have influence over who gets elected to Congress because again, congressmen need money to run their campaign. So if these private industries and, and companies support a campaign of a certain individual, when those individuals get elected, those people who are elected can either create or appropriate funds for new defense weapons contracts, and it all gets woven together. We're going to call this the military industrial complex, where there's a, a connection between the legislature, the private companies, right, who are helping to support through campaign contributions and influencing voters in the Senate, and they're going to, the Senate is then going to be involved in giving contracts to certain companies. So all of this gets woven together in this military industrial complex. And that's going to be, um, in some ways, kind of setting a foundation for potential um, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Potentially some um, unfair practices, maybe behind the scenes deals that can be made. So stay tuned. There's also a conflict in Egypt with the Suez crisis. We have a new leader in Egypt, uh, Abdel Nasser, and he starts to play the, um, the, the powers between the Soviet Union and the United States against one another. And there is a conflict over the Suez Canal and ultimately it becomes nationalized and it is going to hurt um, the relations in the region. This becomes a very unstable region between uh, Egypt and then the uh, control of the canal because each side wants control of it, Great Britain, France do. Um, and then this is again going to be where Eisenhower is going to pressure them to to, to resolve this problem because we don't want Egypt to turn to the Soviet Union for help. So this is going to be kind of a, um, a, an internal conflict between the United States, Great Britain and France, but ultimately they back down. So this leads to the Eisenhower Doctrine, which kind of updates the Truman Doctrine, right? That says we'll go anywhere in the world anytime to support uh, the, the, to stop the spread of communism. The Eisenhower Doctrine updates that and specifically says that in the Middle East, we will do whatever we have to do to resist the spread of communism in that region as well. So they're kind of doing the same thing, but the Eisenhower Doctrine is focused on the Middle East and it largely comes as a result of the Suez Crisis. 1960 is when we see uh, John Kennedy get elected. There is now in place the constitutional amendment that prevents someone from serving more than two terms as president. So Eisenhower is not eligible. And Nixon is going to be the Republican nominee. And um, <clears throat> then Kennedy is going to be the Democratic nominee. So the Democrats bring in Kennedy and he just has this aura about him. He is from this rich family. Um, his father had been an ambassador in England during World War II. Uh, I mean, um, <clears throat> during the earlier years, uh, right after World War I. Kennedy had served in World War II, had been wounded. He was um, you know, touted as a hero in many ways. He had this gorgeous wife and these cute little kids and on and on and on. So sometimes it's referred to as Camelot as being kind of this fairy tale existence. Um, Kennedy and Nixon will go up against one another in uh, televised debates because again, TV is brand new. It's a new way of campaigning. And <clears throat> Kennedy comes off very, very calm, very distinguished. Uh, Nixon is a nervous ninny and he's already kind of a nervous guy, but when he comes in, he had previously been sick and he refuses to use makeup on the TV set. He starts just sweating profusely. 
and he just comes off just terrible. Look at the way that they're sitting. Who looks more comfortable and presidential? Kennedy does. So these debates really help Kennedy in the election. He ultimately will win. Um, the Dixiecrats have their own candidate here because one of the questions about Kennedy that some of these very, very conservative areas of the Deep South were worried about is the fact that he was Catholic. He was our first Catholic president and they were concerned about his objectivity if he were to become president. So his campaign was based on what was called the new frontier, saying that we are going to you know, use this technology, look what he says. Uh, we stand on the edge of a new frontier, the frontier of the 1960s, a frontier of unknown opportunities and perils, a frontier of unfulfilled hopes and threats. The new frontier of which I speak is not a set of promises, it is a set of challenges. And so he's, this is again, he gets into ask not what you can do for your country, but what, I mean, what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. He challenges the United States to put a man on the moon. So this is in, in the context of the, the arms race, the military arms race. So he's saying the new frontier is gonna be space. Let's be the first to go into space. And so it's this constant back and forth rivalry between the Soviet Union and the United States. At the same time that Kennedy is coming in in 1960, or in, he takes office in January of 1961, Fidel Castro had come to power in uh, Cuba. He had overthrown the leader there, Fulgencio Batista in 1959, and Castro is a communist. So here's Fidel Castro as a young man. Here he is as an old man. He was the dictator there up until he died here, um, I don't know, maybe six, seven years ago. Um, one quick incident that occurs here in um, the, the early part of Kennedy's administration, right? He takes office in January of 61. April of 61 is the failure of the Bay of Pigs invasion. So Castro is this, cute, this um, communist dictator that's come in in Cuba. We still have control of Guantanamo Bay, which we had gotten after uh, the Spanish-American War with the Platt Amendment. But um, there was a plan that was initially established during the Truman administration to overthrow Castro. It was gonna be a CIA invasion that some of these Cuban exiles that had been thrown out by Castro were being trained by the CIA operatives in South America. They are going to come in and take over. They're going to evade right here at the Bay of Pigs and then start this revolution within Cuba to overthrow Castro. It fails miserably because they weren't ready. They weren't well-trained, they weren't ready. Kennedy went ahead with the program in April, executing the, the, um, the plan and it fails because there is very little military support for these exiles going in. And it, no, it does nothing more than, than strengthen Castro's power because you've got the Cuban people saying, look at the United States, the United States is invading us. And so Castro plays that up. Later on, right, so this was a huge embarrassment for Kennedy and there were questions about his foreign policy leadership with this crisis that had been such a failure. A year later, we're gonna get into the Cuban Missile Crisis. And we had um, surveillance planes that were constantly flying over um, actually Cuba as well as the Soviet Union. That gets into the U2, U2 spy plane incident as well. But when one of our reconnaissance planes was flying over Cuba, the photographs that were taken and analyzed show that there is the construction of nuclear missile silos being planted on the island of Cuba. Cuba is 90 miles from uh, Florida. So to put that in perspective, that would be about from here to Athens maybe. Um, so it's very close, certainly within range of wiping out the United States. And when these missile silos or these sites are discovered, the actual missiles were on their way to Cuba to be um, installed. We know that Kennedy issues an ultimatum saying that they've got to turn back. And for six days, the world is on high alert, on edge, not knowing what is going to happen because you know he's kind of drawn the line in, in the sand that if these missile sites are, in, are not removed and the missiles are not turned back to the Soviet Union, then the US is going to attack. My dad was in the Air Force at that time and he was stationed in Louisiana. So right there on the Gulf. 
and they were scrambled, they were on high alert, and the planes were locked and loaded, meaning that they had their bombs on the plane, they were installed, and they were ready to take off at a moment's notice. And so he, he stayed in the airplane hangar for days, waiting to see what was going to happen. Ultimately, at the last minute, the ships turned back, and the crisis is averted. And so the outcome of this, you've got Nikita Khrushchev and you've got John Kennedy. And so John Kennedy is this young president who has kind of a black eye already when it comes to uh, the Cold War because of the failure of the Bay of Pigs. But this time around, you've got Khrushchev and Kennedy and they're kind of in this you know, staring contest of who's gonna back down first. Kennedy stays the course, Khrushchev backs down, and it looks like Kennedy now is the stronger leader. How does this make Khrushchev look back in the Soviet Union? It kind of makes him, it, it diminishes his popularity and makes him look weak. Where in the United States, this bolsters Kennedy's reputation as a strong cold warrior. Um, we have efforts by Kennedy in the third world, the Peace Corps, where they're going to um, target different third world nations as we've already talked about for assistance for clean drinking water, um, safety, education, vaccines, health. And so the idea is if you can stabilize the basic needs of people in third world countries, then when they do become more industrialized, their alignment, their allegiance is going to be with the United States. The Peace Corps does still exist today. So lots of young people in the 1960s um, either when they graduated from um, college would, uh, or even from high school, would go into the Peace Corps. Space race. This is also another incident where we see this rivalry between the United States and the Soviet Union play out. So now it's about who can develop, um, you know, technology to go into outer space, the new frontier, as Kennedy called it. So the, the Soviets actually take the early lead here. The Soviet satellite Sputnik is launched in October of 1957. This is all it is. It's basically a transmitter that it goes up into um, the atmosphere and then signals can be received back here on Earth. Later on in November of 1957, Sputnik 2 is launched to see the effects of the atmosphere on living things. And so Lake of the Dog, here she is was a stray that was roaming around Moscow. She and this pack of dogs, stray dogs, they were kind of observed. Leica seemed to be the calmest of the dogs. She was selected. They hooked her up to some um, monitoring uh, devices that would supposedly monitor her blood pressure and her temperature and that kind of thing as she was launched into space. Um, unfortunately, Leica most likely died of um, severe anxiety during the launch of the satellite. So um, she is, she did not um, survive to transmit any sort of information about that. So early on, you know, Sputnik is kind of indicating to the American people, oh my gosh, we're getting behind. So look at this cartoon, U.S. complacency. So here's our, our nice shiny airplane with all this money that we've pumped into defense weapons. And they're kind of sitting back. Look, the guy's got his feet on the dashboard. And then all of a sudden, there goes Sputnik uh, around here. So it looks like the US is behind. As a result, there is going to be a huge emphasis on catching up. And everything's going to be about the space race and about STEM, basically. So the National Defense Education Act, all of this money is going to be pumped into research. There is going to be an effort to better train high school science teachers to make sure that they're sparking this interest in the best and the brightest of our students. And if you wanted to go to college, there was no Hope Scholarship at this time. Small percentage of uh, the population that graduates from high school actually go to college. But with the National Defense Education Act, if you're gonna major in a science related field, you could go to college um, with very, very cheap with these loans. And then also NASA is created. So this was a, a huge, huge um, effort in the United States. All right, so everything else in this chapter that's about Vietnam, we're gonna save that for um, the next unit. So, so keep that in mind. Uh, actually, it'll be later in unit eight, but we're gonna save it for a later chapter and put it all together as one. All right, so until next time, keep reading and go make history. Bye.